Hi, everyone. I'm Mike Fisher. I'm the CTO at Etsy. Thanks for joining me today. Um, so I've been at Etsy about a year. Uh, before that, um, I ran a consultancy for about 10 years, and one of my clients happened to be Etsy, so I've known them for a very long time. And I'm excited to share um, the story about Etsy and moving to the cloud with you today. So Etsy is a global marketplace, if you're not familiar with this. Um, we have two million creative entrepreneurs that are connected to over 35 million active buyers through the 50 million unique items that they make. And these are artisans and craftspeople who hand make um, items or collect vintage items and sell them to the buyers. Um, we see ourselves in the marketplace as a force for good, that in the US where only 40% of entrepreneurs are women, the creative entrepreneurs at Etsy are over 87%. Most of them work from home because they're artists and craftspeople. They turn their extra bedroom, their kitchen table, the garage, into their studios and workplaces. Um, and our sellers are really the heart um, of Etsy and the, the products that they make. And I'm going to share with you a, a quick video about one of our sellers, uh, Diane Nort, who um, I find very inspiring about the, the care and, and what she puts into making um, Etsy's products. I think about my sheep like 24 hours a day. What makes my blanket special is that there's an animal husbandry side of what I do. Right now I have 46 sheep. So we've got Eddie and Rudy, Cricket and Joan, Jane, and then there's Teddy. I raise the sheep and uh, keep them their whole lives, and the wool is grown here on our farm. I'll go out in the morning and tend to the animals, trimming their feet, feeding them, shearing them once a year. When I'm dyeing wool, I use all plant dyes. It is a full-time job. I grew up on a farm and then went to college and studied fashion design. Thinking I wanted to go to a big city, and by the end of college, I just had decided that weaving was what I wanted to do, and having a sheep farm and raising my own wool was my goal. Since Etsy came along, it's revolutionized crafting because it reaches a real worldwide audience. I could be here at home, work from my basement, and I can reach a customer that's all over the world. It's pretty exciting. We are living in a time when people care about where their food and their items, their crafts come from. The blankets are woven on a traditional loom without electricity. Everything is powered by my hands and feet. This is what I imagined when I um, was in college and I started to think about farm life. So hopefully that gave you a sense of the type of care um, that our sellers put into their products and, and how much they really means to them. Um, and so that's what we find the power of the marketplace is to be able to enable these creative entrepreneurs. But we not only see that the power that we can do good for our sellers, but also for our employees. Um, again, you know, in a world where um, we only see 14% women engineers in the industry, Etsy's a leader that we see over 30% um, of our engineers are women. And if you increase that for the entire t uh, technology team, um, it's, it's much higher than that. Five out of eight of our executive team are women, and we have gender parity across our board. And so not only do we see ourselves you know, as a force for good um, in the world, but we also think that we can do good for our employees. Last fall, we announced our mission of keep commerce human. And you know, a lot of companies try to use technology to replace people, but as Etsy, we see the mission as using technology to enable people to connect um, with each other and to, you know, to augment that, that relationship and their tasks that they do. You know, and whether that's connecting a seller to a buyer and trying to eliminate the, the currency issues or the communication issues or the shipping issues across the world, or trying to empower an employee to help fight fraud, you know, we see technology as augmenting this instead of replacing. And in a world of increasing automation and commoditization, 
creativity can't be automated and that human connection really cannot be commoditized. So this is what drew me to Etsy is the ability to use two things that I love, which is helping support entrepreneurs and applying technology. And it's the combination of those two things um, that brought me to Etsy and keep all of us motivated each day to continue working for the sellers and buyers. Now, Etsy engineers, as I mentioned, I've known them for a, a number of years. They've always had a really strong engineering culture. And we were very innovative in the early years um, in some of the areas that um, like CICD. So we were one of the early places that did continuous integration, continuous deployment, DevOps, the concept of monitoring everything. All of these were early, early concepts um, that Etsy participated in. And at the time, there weren't a lot of tools, um, and so they developed them. The analogy would be that if we were building our house, that we actually went out and cut down the trees and hand hewed the logs and really, you know, made our own floors um, like the pioneers. And when I came on board a year ago, um, one of the first tasks that um, uh, our CEO asked me to look at was, should we be in some of these areas again? Should we be you know, hand building our own monitoring stacks? Um, and one of the things that I looked at first, because it was such a, a, a big part of our organization, was the infrastructure. So we we're still in data centers, um, in a lot of cases still running on bare metal. And so I took a look at that and said, you know, is this really where we should be concentrating our engineering efforts? Are we in a world now that we can leverage a partner to do this with? And so this started us down the cloud path to look at can we find a vendor who could partner with us and support us and let us concentrate on helping the sellers and buyers? And so continuing that analogy of the house, you know, we're in a world now where you can hire an architect and, you know, and the subcontractors and stuff to build that house for us. And so this is what we, you know, we looked at the cloud journey about a year ago and said, let's start down that path and let's figure out who we can partner with. Now, a lot of the things that make Etsy unique and special also make it incredibly challenging from a technology perspective. So all of those 50 million items are unique, handmade, creative. We like to think of it sometimes as the world's largest flash sale, in that once that item is sold, there's often not another item like it. Um, we also have unstructured data. So we don't have a structured listing, we, are, we don't have SKUs, we don't have catalogs and things like that that a lot of our products fall into that a typical e-commerce company would have. And so because of that, it makes a lot of things challenging in terms of finding that right item for those buyers and to search all 50 million items. So lots of challenges. And of course, we're a global company. We're in almost every country in the world. And so connecting the sellers across that to sell their products, to communicate, to transfer currencies, to ship those products, all of those make our jobs really, really challenging, but that's what's fun about it. One of the areas that is specifically challenging because of this data is search. So in a typical search algorithm that's using TFIDF, we look at the, you know, the titles, the tags, the descriptions, things like that, but the challenge is that those sellers, like Diane Nort, can describe the wool blankets any way that she wants. She can talk in her description about the sheep and how she raised them and how she's, you know, but someone else who's, who's making another wool blanket might call it something very different. And so that makes it really, really challenging for a typical search, you know, solar index or something like that to find the right results. And so this is one of the areas that we found that we could apply machine learning onto to provide better results for the sellers. And so enter something that we call CSR, which is context-specific ranking. So Etsy generates almost a billion, over a billion events a day for their buyers. So the buyers are clicking, they're looking at stuff, they're favoriting, they're adding to cart, they're, they're purchasing things. All of that data gets processed, and we can use that in our machine learning algorithms to re-rank the search results so that the results end up being exactly what the buyers are looking for and not a combination of everything that's possible out there. So this is an example of that. Um, on the left, you'll see a typical search result for alarm clocks in this case. But on Etsy, when you search for alarm clocks, you might be looking for an actual alarm clock. You also might be looking for parts to an alarm clock that you want to put in a piece of art that you're making. 
or you might be looking for stickers of alarm clocks, you might be looking for prints, you, there's no telling what you, you know, are really looking for. And so in our CSR, on the right-hand side, where we've taken all of the queries that happened days and days before and looked at what the users interacted with, and we apply that back and re-rank the search results. And with that, we have something that the user um, finds as a better search result. And we see this in the data of conversions and the number of pages they have to, you know, to, to process through in the search and all this. And all of that leads us to show that it's a better result for the buyers. Another example is wedding gowns. That on Etsy, you may be looking for the material to actually, um, to actually sew or make your wedding gown. You could also be looking for bridesmaids gifts or wedding gown hangers or any other number of items when you search for wedding gowns. And so with CSR, we can actually apply machine learning on top of those search results and produce a better result for the buyer. But all of this, as I mentioned, takes a lot of data and a lot of compute capacity. In fact, you know, that 1.2 billion results um, Sometimes you know, it can take almost 24 hours to process that data. And you know, if we train our algorithms on more than a couple weeks worth of data, we run into capacity issues. And so if you're in a traditional data center, which we have been, you know this cycle, that you have to plan and budget months and months ahead of time. And then you have to order stuff, depending if you're doing large orders, maybe even you know, a number of months ahead. And then you need to receive it, you need to rack it, you need to set it up, and finally, you can actually let the developers have access to it. And so this cycle is really not conducive if you want to do fast and really flexible um, changes in the machine learning, the data, the feature set, the feature engineering, all of that that we want to have a really high cy cycle time on isn't very conducive. But we also want to use this in a sustainable way. If we didn't keep commerce human in everything we do, meaning the way we do our compute power to the way that we consume food and you know, energy in our offices, the way we heat and cool our offices, if we didn't do it in a sustainable passion, uh, you know, way, it wouldn't, be the way that, it wouldn't be the way that we're keeping commerce human. And so sustainability is a really big deal for us. And so we've got to look at not only how do we get a lot more compute capacity very flexibly, but in a sustainable fashion. So this graph in the upper left is a typical sort of e-commerce cycle. Even though we're global, you know, the US is one of our largest markets, and this is a typical cycle of the early evening hours, you know, traffic isn't as great, it spikes up, you see the dip when everyone sort of travels home, commutes home, and then you know, while they're watching TV at night, they're shopping on Etsy. Um, over on the right is the idle time of our web servers, and it's about inverse of this. So, when the site gets very busy, we start to you know, reduce the, the CPU idle. When the site isn't so busy, um, we get upwards of 90% idle. Now, the interesting thing is this is our energy consumption in our data center, and you'll notice that it's flat. Because we don't have you know, a virtual environment where we can share with someone else, we can't, when we're not using that, give it back. We don't shut down the servers. Once they're in, they're in. And so this isn't a very sustainable way to provide compute capacity for the marketplace. And we care about this so much, we have publicly stated our goals around having an ecological impact, that we want 100% renewable energy in the offices and in the data centers and everything that are in our compute uh, by 2020. And we want to reduce the intensity of this by 25% um, by 2025. And the majority of that is our compute. It's taken up by the data center. And so that, that is a very big goal of the engineering team at Etsy is to focus on that. And then of course we have um, other ecological impact goals that we've announced. And so enter the cloud. The cloud allows us the flexibility, uh, the compute power that we need, all of this to do it in a sustainable way. And so that's what started us on the journey to look at cloud. The other thing is we mentioned we're a global company. And you know, as you know, performance matters on e-commerce sites, on search engines, all of this. Um, what you'll see is page load times across different countries. Um, we've highlighted a couple here for Brazil and India, and you'll see that they spike up and have really, really terrible load times. You know, Google's own research shows that just increasing from one to three seconds, and you get a 32% increase in bounce rate. And if you increase it over 10 seconds, you get 130-some percent bounce rate. 
And so this is really important to us, that when we're trying to allow sellers and buyers across the world to connect to each other, we have to have really fast performance. And having our data centers located in the US you know, um, doesn't help us with this. Even though we use CDNs to, you know, for our static content, we have a lot of dynamic content that we need to generate in the data centers or um, on site. And so having a global presence with a provide, cloud provider really is going to enable us to improve our performance. And so the decision was made that we're going to look um, for a cloud provider partner. But we really wanted one that fit with our culture. As I mentioned, Etsy has a really strong engineering culture, and we wanted one that we could partner with and really, really believe that they get our culture. We wanted one that focused on machine learning. You know, I describe the marketplace really as an iceberg. And the marketplace is the tip of the iceberg, and behind it, what you don't see is all of those billion events that get processed every single day in our big data infrastructure, and then all of that machine learning that we, you know, I mentioned one small application of it, but we're applying it in lots of ways, and we're going to keep applying it more and more. And so we wanted someone who had a real focus on machine learning. We also wanted those international data centers so that we could have points of presence um, around the world. And then, of course, that strong commitment to environmental sustainability. We want someone who really understood what we meant and how we felt about it and could partner with that. And so the question was, well, how do you decide who fits all of these criteria? So we took one big project of migrate to the, the cloud and broke it down into a bunch of smaller projects. And we have, you know, even though it's a single marketplace, we have hundreds of systems um, within the marketplace and within the big data and the machine learning and all of these um, that power that. And so we broke that into all of these sub-projects. We used a RACI model to assign ownership of those. And we asked those owners to take that vision of that system through an architecture review. Some of these systems were going to be ported, lifted and shifted. Some of them are going to use new technologies. Some of them were going to be redesigned completely to be cloud ready. And so we wanted the owners of these systems to take that through the architecture review process. And what came out of that is a set of requirements. Thousands of requirements from all of these sub-projects of what they would need going to the cloud and out of the data center. And so we took all of those and used a tool called a decision matrix. We put all the requirements into the decision matrix, and then we worked with our cloud providers to do experiments and to do lots of technical meetings and architecture reviews with the different cloud providers to get their input on how best to design and implement our systems. And this decision matrix looks something like this. Across the top, we have our functional requirements. These are the things that are overarchingly important to our business. The relationship, the cost, the ease of use, the value-added services, security, locations, all of these are things that are really, really important. And they're kind of overarching requirements. And then down the left, you'll see all of these sub-project requirements that people came up with. And there's literally thousands. This is just a, you know, a screenshot of that. And then we weighted them. And we said, these customer requirements how did they impact the functional requirements? And what we got out of that was a, was a thousands of customer requirements that were weighted. So we knew that which ones were the most important to us. We then used these weighted scores to have the engineers rank the different providers based on that. And so as they went through their experimentation or their discussions, they could use the decision matrix to rank them. And they could say, this, this provider fulfills this, this provider doesn't. At the end, when you cross multiply everything out, you have tens of thousands of data points that you can compare these providers with. And in our case, GCP had over 50,000 points. They won by over 10%. And by using this matrix, we tried to eliminate people's bias. And bias because they either preferred one provider or another, or they only had experience with one provider or another. Um, and we tried to eliminate all of that and make this a very quantifiable approach that we felt good with, that we knew that they were going to support our requirements and meet our business needs. And so we're moving, moving very quickly. That um, we, a, we announced the partnership in December that we we're going to move to migrate everything out of our data centers to GCP. We're on a two-year timeline. Um, 
we almost immediately migrated all of our image serving off of the um, of Etsy into GCP, and lots of lots of other sub projects. The machine learning um, training uh, infrastructure is now migrated to GCP, um, and so lots of these sub projects are already in step. But we're planning on a, a full two year migration to get all of our systems out of there. Etsy Web is the big one. And so we're trying to break that down into as many small pieces as possible um, to move the marketplace um, up to GCP. And we, of course, have to do this around the busy times of year. Typical e-commerce com company where we have um, you know, lots, of, lots of traffic in the Q4 around holidays. And so all of that has to be taken into consideration in timing of this. But we already have all of this running in the cloud and we're doing loader performance testing um, on that right now. And so that's how we're building up confidence, is replaying traffic against the GCP infrastructure with the Etsy web marketplace running there. And so um, that's all of that's going into the migration step of this. And so just to recap, um, before we take some questions, you know, we're a global marketplace. Um, we really, really believe in our mission of keep commerce human. And that means everything that we do has to follow that. Um, and that means not only our engineering, but the way we host, the way we build our products, all of this. We have a very strong engineering culture, um, and we wanted someone, a partner that could, could, uh, could meet us there and, and really you know, fit within our culture. We did this, you know, made the decision, and are doing the migration by dividing it up into a number of small projects, utilizing that decision matrix so that we have a quantifiable decision that we can feel good about and stand behind that we made the right decision. And migrating to GCP really allows us to do this in a sustainable fashion, that they really get where we're coming from in terms of having 100% renewable energy um, and, and sustainably. And really, you know, we found, I think, someone that's proven to be a great partner um, in the migration with this. <laughs>